start the live stream. Great. Okay, so welcome everyone once again. Uh, this is a presentation of a uh, FEM project, a uh, feminist in the environmental movement that's being done uh, by Green European Foundation and uh, yeah, with support of Cooperation and Development Network Eastern Europe. Um, this meeting is being live streamed and uh, it will it, naturally it will be recorded. So please pay attention that uh, if you do not want your uh, your um, your video shown, uh, but do not turn it on because it will be um, all there recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Um, I would like to thank you for coming. So on this event, this online event, we will um, it will last about hour to hour and a half. And uh, we will have uh, seven local reporters from uh, seven countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, to present the stories that they have done so far in the project. So my name is Maya and I am from Bosnia and Herzegovina, from, but I live in Czech Republic and I am the activity assistant of this project and uh, will be moderating today. So for one, uh, those, who, those of you who are not uh, aware of CDN's moderation rules, uh, please, if you want to use, uh, if you want a word or if you have some technical uh, points. So if you want a word, you can write your name in the chat. Um, and if you want, uh, um, if you have some technical point, please just write technical and then write it in the chat what the technical point is, um, because the space will go first to uh, the local reporters for presentation. So what we will be doing today is uh, first we will tell you a little bit about um, what uh, FEM project actually is. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, yes. <laughs> also, please keep yourself muted um, uh, unless you are given a word. Um, so today we will have present uh, we will have first a little bit of introduction, then we will have a CN from uh, Green European Foundation to tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, feminist and the environmental movement in general, and then we will have uh, presentations of local reporters, uh, their local research, what they have been doing. Um, after that. Sorry, technical, I hope you can hear me still. Um, yes, uh, if you have any questions after local reporters' presentations, uh, please write your name in the chat and uh, they will answer the questions specifically for the local research after the, after the discussion, presentations and discussion are done. So I hope this is clear for everyone. Um, and I see people are joining. Thank you so much once again. Um, so, first of all, I would like to tell you a little bit about the uh, Feminist in the Environmental Movement Project from Cooperation and Development Network Eastern Europe side. Uh, it is a project that is being done to kind of raise voices of young women living in rural areas who are um, impacted by climate change and environmental movement. Um, uh, environmental issues like industries and so on, um, as well as any other issues they are facing that is a consequence of uh, climate change. So it is a very intersectional project and um, it is part of a much bigger picture uh, that I will now give CN. Thank you, Maya. Um, one second as I share my screen. Um, so my name is uh, Sin, I'm a senior project coordinator at the Green European Foundation, um, where among other things, I um, yeah, help uh, coordinate our work around uh, gender and feminism. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say a few words on uh, the broader project Feminist and the Environmental Movement, what we're doing around all of Europe, um, and also how you can potentially get uh, involved even beyond you know, being here today at this webinar and, and the, uh, the activities that we have with Cooperation and Development Network Eastern Europe. Um, maybe a very quick word about uh, the Green European Foundation for those of you who don't know us. So Jeff is a, a European political foundation. We're affiliated to um, the European Greens, which means the European Green Party, the Greens in the European Parliament, um, and also the Federation of Young European Greens. But we have kind of our own role as a political foundation, as an educational force, uh, stimulating debates and in doing so, we work with other organizations around all of Europe, um, including CDN, of course. 
Um, yeah, we have kind of three areas of work, study and debate, capacity building and networking, and all three of those come together really in our work around uh, gender and feminism. Um, we uh, obviously see the fight for gender equality um, and against all forms of, of discrimination as very central. It's a core green value. Um, and in recent years, we've really tried to work more also on um, intersectional approaches and really making it also clear and stimulating conversations about how um, gender issues intersect with environmental issues, with social justice issues, um, which is obviously also a very core part of, uh, of this project. Um, and basically how embracing feminist and intersectional approaches also allows us to do better for our communities as well as for the planet. In this work, we work with uh, CDN, uh, as already mentioned. We're also working currently with OICOS, who are a Belgian uh, political foundation, the Green Economics Institute in the UK, uh, Green Thought Association in Turkey, Visio, who are an educational institute in um, Finland, and Strefa Zieleni in Poland. So we're really trying to kind of bring together um, people from around Europe. Um, some of the things that we've done already, uh, this is kind of a snapshot of some publications, uh, some work that we've done. Um, again, we work both on sort of study and debate uh, and, and, and having stimulating conversations around these topics. So we have a new publication that's quite uh, fresh, which is called Dare to Care, Ecofeminism as a Source of Inspiration. Um, we have it in English at the moment, but also in Polish and uh, German, and we have a Turkish translation, hopefully coming up later this year. Um, and it's really an introduction to ecofeminism for basically anyone who's, who's interested in, in kind of it as a thought, but also as a, uh, uh, I don't know, guideline for action, because basically part two of the book talks about our, our current uh, economic and social systems and kind of how we've forgotten how to center care in, uh, in those systems and, and the lessons that ecofeminism holds in, in rethinking um, our economies. Um, we also have a uh, climate feminism audiobook. We have a guide as well. Uh, when we talk about capacity building, we have a guide for people targeted by online violence because that's unfortunately also something that we see in our work around gender and feminism that some of the, uh, the great yeah, young activists that we work with also have to deal uh, with the darker side of that. Um, so we also want to equip them to be um, safe online and in person. Um, and finally, we take people everywhere. Last year, we had 20 feminist climate ambassadors um, who were these really inspiring um, young activists from across Europe. And we ended up taking quite a few of them to COP26. So they went through kind of a training process program all year um, and then we uh, we took them to Glasgow to kind of put a lot of what they learned into action um, and also bring a little bit more diversity to uh, to a lot of the uh, yeah the spaces there um, so that's a little bit of a, a snapshot um, as uh, Maya mentioned feminists in the environmental movement is a bigger project lots of partners involved so this year um, we're doing a bit of a book tour with this ecofeminist book that I mentioned, have more translations coming up. We also have local events and trainings that will be coming up in Turkey, Poland, the UK, and possibly other countries throughout the autumn. And we have an online course um, on green feminism that we are developing with our Finnish partners, Visio, and that will be available on our online learning platform, Green Academy. Um, all to say, please get in touch, please get involved. I'm going to drop a few uh, links in the chat. I'm very excited to, uh, to hear the local stories or the stories from our local reporters here. Um, those, of course, will also be a very important part of the project in the autumn as we, as we hope to bundle them into a publication um, and really share them across Europe. Um, so yeah, definitely also if you have any ideas, connections, if you're involved locally and you want to make use of some of our resources or know if there are translations of XYZ materials, um, you're always welcome to reach out to, to me and to Jeff. Um, and that's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sin, so much uh, for presenting Jeff and Feminist in the Environmental Movement. And now we can move on to, to local reporters. So I may have not mentioned that uh, these local reporters, they are members of uh, CDN network, uh, members of uh, CDN member organization, and uh, people who have been involved for a very long time. Well, very long time. They have been around, and uh, they have uh, they have had. Uh, so, in the beginning of the project, we had 
uh, training for local reporters, which was a training on how to do local how to do research uh, in a non-biased and ethical way so that they can have some uh, background information how to do their local researches. And um, yeah, they are all the, um, you will you will meet them all now. Uh, so I would just like to um, remind you that if you have any questions, uh, you can ask uh, in the chat with your name and to which reporter it was directed. And if you have some additional questions, you can contact uh, me at uh, my email, which uh, I will write you later. It's uh, yeah, I will write. Um, so. This, uh, these researches will be gathered into a publication that will be published later this year. And as Sian said, it will be disseminated throughout Europe. And uh, for now, we will just get a little bit of a teaser to see what they're about. So I would like to give floor now to local, local reporters to present themselves and, uh, um, and what they have been doing. Uh, first, uh, I would give floor to Elena. Thanks, Maya. Hello, everyone. Um, hope you're having a good day. Thank you for joining. Um, so uh, I am uh, from Belgrade, Serbia. I'm involved with a local Green Youth of Serbia uh, organization, and I've been also around CDN for some years. And um, so uh, as much as I love and appreciate, and I think it, everything is super relevant, we as young Greens do, uh, climate change is uh, like a um, priority topic, focal uh, topic of mine. Uh, I'm studying uh, climate change and with young Greens, what I had the opportunity to do is to understand all the different dimensions of climate change. So also social aspect, economic aspect, and so on. And uh, that brings us to Feminists in the Environmental Movement Project. Um, I've, um, I've been looking into a story that I'm gonna just uh, very, um, uh, to share in a very a narrow way maybe, because you'll be, you will have opportunity to read the whole thing uh, once the publication is finalized. Um, to be quite honest, uh, just before this project, I didn't know much about this story and I didn't even, uh, know that uh, it was uh, it was an issue and it, that it was an environmental issue. So we know about uh, different things that are contributing to climate change, you no? Know? And uh, more of these things are getting into uh, media and uh, public discourse. We have now uh, quite some movements also active around environmental issues and climate change in in our region and. Um, uh, this was a thing that I personally never read so much about and never really thought about, and it is uh, roads construction. So um, there is a, a highway being built in Serbia that is supposed to connect uh, Belgrade, the capital, with the very south, uh, Montenegro, and uh, already some part of this highway uh, is done, is finished, and it's open for use. Uh, two years ago, approximately, um, but uh, already, already now they are uh, reconstructing it and filling up the holes that uh, popped up, uh, which is not really um, a novelty, uh, at least uh, for our context. Um, but um, apart from that <laughs> issue, uh, I haven't had idea of the impacts that again roads have on the environment. But I'm sure that all of you have taken a highway at least once in life, no? And we see that usually these highways are just passing through these beautiful paisages, beautiful nature. And sometimes also there are houses around, uh, around these big roads. And uh, again, I haven't thought about it as much because I always thought that uh, no matter the noise pollution that uh, these roads uh, by the end of the day have, uh, there, there are these soundproof panels no, that are supposed to kind of protect people in the surrounding area. Um, so when I started to go back to the point, when I started looking more into protests that have been around the construction of this highway in Serbia, I've been learning more and more about the struggles that these local uh, locals have. Uh, particularly locals around the uh, city of Chachak, which is my birthplace. Um, they have been protesting uh, for almost two years now for 
uh, different things, but uh, by the end of the day, the same kind of thing. No, so these are people that uh, whose land and houses uh, were being expropriated. No, because the construction the construction of this highway was marked as of uh, as a project of national interest. So uh, expropriation was following. And um, what was the issue is that. Uh, why why protests took place? No, is that these people got uh, minimum notice or no notice at all, and they they didn't really have much time to uh, get around the idea of having to move their whole lives and leave their homes in which uh, generations of families were living, uh, and to just yeah get displaced uh, in uh, in a matter of weeks or months. No. Uh, this was the one problem, and the, this is the time frame uh, they were given to uh, reconsider their livelihoods and ho households. Uh, I say livelihoods because, as you can see here on the on this picture, there are some tra tractors. I'm not sure how they're called in English. Uh, these people live off of their lands, and they they are doing agriculture. They are small farmers, and they live off, off of that. Not just that they feed themselves, but they also sell this produce, and uh, this is how they this is how they survive, basically. So it it was a really existential question for them. And um, another thing that was very problematic was the price of this land. No matter the fact that this area was not as populated as um, estimated uh, costly before. Uh, with the highway um, uh, construction, it should have been uh, kind of recognized as as a more um, rich land. No, uh, also in terms of like future infrastructure projects that will follow at some point. Uh, these people were being offered uh, sometimes for the land also fifty cents per square meter. So really nothing. Uh, for the houses, they were being offered more, but still this was uh, in the grand scale of things, thinking of you having to leave your income, source of income, your house and move somewhere. This was very low money. So people were trying to um, kind of make appeals to courts and there are still people uh, now some uh, hundred uh, households protesting, trying to um, ask the state to do something and they managed to do something um, in this sense to to ask the state they managed to meet with the prime minister twice uh, however uh, they were just getting empty promises and not really much in reality and um, another thing um, uh, now to speak about the uh, feminism uh, in this uh, in this uh, aspect um, I um, I've heard about the story and then I was going to look um, you know, for women that were involved because as you can see on this picture there are some women that are involved. However, it was very difficult at the beginning to uh, to find someone that would speak, to find someone that, that was really active. Like most of the journals that were speaking, uh, portraying this issue were um, just... Um, uh, writing down words of uh, men that were speaking at protests, uh, there was very, to like zero mention of any any non male being involved. Uh, so it took some digging, and I did have uh, I do have some contacts. Uh, one of which uh, has very interesting things to share that will be uh, included in the publication. This is the, the, the very young activist uh, from the area uh, surrounding Chachak that uh, was getting on protests, but also getting on social media and trying to speak about this. Because as much as I mentioned the journals and meeting with the prime minister, this story never really took off and never really hit the, um, the headlines as some other issues uh, were hitting. Uh, and this is partially because it, it's such a small community that it doesn't, it didn't get the attention of more uh, people. So uh, this uh, this young activist uh, is an architect and never, uh, for my knowledge at least, she wasn't really an activist before, but this is something that really struck her and she was trying to put it out there as much as possible and to, um, to speak about the struggles that her uh, family and herself were going through. 
Um, so this is, uh, sorry if I breached my time, <laughs> I'm not gonna go on more. Uh, I, we will go to the questions and answers part later. So that's that might be all from my side for now. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, and uh, now we can go on with Ana Maria. And yeah, as Elena said, if you have any questions, feel free to feel feel free to write them in the chat. We will go back to them after the discussion. Uh, so now maybe Ana Maria can take. Thank you, Maya. Uh, my name is Ana Maria. I am a social worker. Uh, currently working in a safe house for women victims of. Uh, domestic violence. Um, I also work with women who uh, survived war torture, and I am an activist for almost uh, eight years, year, years now. Uh, maybe we can start the presentation. So the topic I'm talking about is uh, the about the region of women in Podrinje. Uh, to get a bit more knowledgeable about uh, Podrinje, uh, that's a region, region uh, that is um, actually uh, by the river Drina, and uh, that region is, uh, because of that, um, very uh, relying, it had relied on agriculture. Uh, that region is populated with Orthodox and Muslims. Uh, during the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina that uh, lasted from 1992 to 1995. Uh, this region suffered a lot because it was on a front line and Serbia wanted to have it for itself. Uh, during all four years of the war, many bad things happened there and all civilians of all, of all backgrounds suffered. But one of the most horrifying things happened in July of 1995 when Serbian army captured and killed over 8,000 boys and men only because they had names that are considered Muslim, and they exiled their mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters. Uh, war ended in November of 1995, and Virginia region was uh, more or less empty and filled with terror and hate. Um, next slide. In 1994, here in Tuzla, uh, German activists and therapists together with some other people, actually women, women from Tuzla, founded an organization uh, whose goal was to help uh, women that were escaping war zones. Uh, they worked in improvised and horrible migration centers around Tuzla and met many women and families from Podrinje. Uh, they provi provided psychosocial support to those people and in early 2000s, when people started to return to their pre-war homes, uh, they still needed support and Viva Jene was kind of following them. Uh, all people from Podrinje were scared and mistrustful. Hate between the Orthodox and Muslim population was huge. Uh, Viva Jene started to work with all of them together in their communities, and slowly people started to cooperate and look at each other through different lens. Next slide. Um, so after the first signs of reconciliation, Viva Jene team knew that in order to keep the relations good, uh, they should not let the politicians manipulate people into hate again. Uh, they started to work with uh, women on democratizing uh, the society and empowering them. Um, all of them had experience in agriculture and they all needed to learn more about women's rights. Therefore, those two topics were connectors for all the upcoming work. Uh, Viva Jene gathered a group of women from different municipalities and worked on gender, and gender empowerment. At first, it was important to help them realize that they are not less worthy than men, that they have rights, and that their hard work should be valued. Jointly, they got the idea to create fairs where they could present and sell their products. It's usually fresh fruit and vegetables and products made, uh, made out of um, veggies and fruits. Uh, that idea turned out to be really good and in impactful. Uh, women earned, earned the money invested in themselves, felt powerful, and started to fill the entire communities. And next slide. So I joined the Viva Jene team last summer, and soon after I uh, met this group of women, I was inspired by their hard work and their energy and what they did uh, accomplished over the years. Uh, the feeling uh, of gratitude towards Viva Jene was tangible. Uh, they started, they, they shared their, their life stories with me. Uh, they actually lived without knowing 
that they have uh, same rights as men. Um, they thought that they are not allowed to have or do anything but be housewives. Um, they said that money they earn now from agriculture is their only stream of income and that it helps them to feel better about themselves. They told me about their ideas and how they want to help their communities. They said that if it was not for Viva Jena, they probably wouldn't talk to each other. But now they're calling all women their friends and they will work together to help each other. Um, right away, I started to think how more people should know about these women and their work. So when I saw the call for local reporters, I knew, I knew that I had to write about them. What is very good about them is that they usually produce all organic uh, products. Uh, some of them are certified and some not, because in order to get certified, you have to get through a long process and that costs, costs them a lot. Um, they work uh, usually everything without uh, any uh, hard machinery, heavy machinery and uh, they buy and sell or, uh, everything locally. Uh, everything that is considered as some sort of a leftover, uh, they usually give to their family uh, and um, their friends who are in need or just they trade among themselves. Uh, some of them manage to register as a small business and others uh, work, um, let's say, like non-registered. <laughs> Um, next slide. Uh, so now we work with a group of uh, 70 women of different background and different age. Some of them are 20 and some 60. 60. In this research, I talked with all of them, but I did sep uh, also did separate interviews with women from, uh, from this picture. Uh, so we see here Nehada, who is 34, and she grew up in immigration center near Tuzla and has been doing agriculture and charity work uh, for years. Uh, Vive Jene and Behia met in 1995. She was only 13 and already married, uh, living in a migrant center near Tuzla. She makes juices and honey. Uh, so Ada was on, also only a teenager when she fled the war and came to Tuzla. Now her family is very successful, having their own farm and fields. And Vesna was um, 19 when she fled the Sarajevo and, became, and came to Bratunas. In 1995, she's a feminist and advocates for better women's rights in Bratunat. That's it. Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, yeah, more about this local, local research. Uh, maybe now Osge can take the floor. Yes, thank you, Maya. And... Well, my presentation will come soon. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all, all of them, you are good. And I am Özge, and I am the project coordinator of the, uh, at the Green Tool Association for now. And also, I am the researcher, especially about the environmental issues. And that's why actually I'm here today. And this is my topic is like extinction in town of thermal power plants. And narratives from local women. So that's uh, I just uh, well I want to answer to some questions with this presentation, and I want to explain my uh, research. Maybe next page, which question is like considered? So why like uh, this topic and these places? So first of all, actually. Uh, when I came here to, around to five years ago as a like master student, and I was study, I, I was searching about the environmental movements in Chanakkale and the, the Chanakkale city and the Chan, like local town in that city, and I started some like uh, interviews with there, and also I joined to some like uh, struggles there, and I getting to know more about what's going on there and I will be just more feel attached to the people living there. So after my thesis, I start I still uh, continue with uh, my relation with them uh, as an activist. And after that like we shoot a documentary is like about the Chan. Chan is the the, the place 
that I research and we'll continue. Uh, and just, I have to ask, you hear the loud voice, the outside, or it's okay, my voice? Uh, you're heard. Okay, you're because heard when you're some there are many children outside, and if you not hear very well, just, uh, I can handle it probably. Anyway, so, well, for now, I just, with this uh, research, I want to focus on the, the, the local woman's perspective because um, many like NGOs or the organizations try to do something there, but I think we like we are not listening to really like the people, especially the women who live there. So I just want to listen to them and the, I like my frame mostly focus on the climate justice connection with climate justice and the gender inequality. So the where is next next page. Uh, well, another one. <laughs> yes, like more and more. <laughs> uh, where is the chan? And like, it's so near to like around the five hours from Istanbul, and it's the north uh, northwest part of Turkey. And it's like to middle of the city actually. So the base, the place based there. So before the place is explained, I just a uh, uh, little bit definition about to climate uh, justice and the connection with the gender. So there is the like Indian activist uh, Disha Ravi and little bit uh, explanation about the what is climate justice. Actually, he said it's a fight alongside is the hardest displayed, whose rivers have been poisoned, whose lands were stolen, who uh, the water their houses get washed away every other season, and who fight uh, to the fire what are basic human rights. So also the many social injustice already feeding actually climate injustice. So the gender issues, one of them actually. So the was going in Chan, and in the Chan, Chan, in the uh, town of the Chan, actually has a long story. Is then is a uh, beginning of to like uh, to Republic of Turkey's economical developing process. The the this town really changed quickly uh, because of their like uh, start to like uh, establish a factories and the, the the town is getting more immigrants from outside and the, their like demographics quickly change and also the during the, this like 19s 80s and the 70s uh, there are many actually like labor uh, unrest because of the, this like uh, unhumiliating conditions in these factories, but uh, the government and the like two companies like they crushed uh, all of the employers. And after that, this town re really became a silent and no one is just doing anything about that. And after the after the 90s, actually beginning of 20, like millennium, is like this project is the first coal thermal power plant is the plan was planning and the uh, established. So, well, there are some like uh, the struggles against the, this uh, places, but uh, it's not, it wasn't, it, uh, it didn't work. So, and after that, the second one, I feel like uh, uh, maybe 15 years, the second one I also uh, operated. Now is that there are the two Called climate plant and other like gold mining and other projects still like planning and the people try to do something about that but they are really like to fearing about their like economical condition because it belongs to this so i talk with the woman and uh, i try to learn what is their condition about that some of them is just like standing here but uh it's really like complicated and it's so the woman in the chan is like uh, they are really 
suffering because of this power plants and they they losing their like fundamental rights and they are not socializing and they also they lose the, their economical uh, livelihoods and also when I uh, speak with them it's just to like they most mostly want to leave this this from this town and actually mostly they're also hopeless because it's um, well is also the the connecting with the struggles they uh, they have no so voices not all the time is like because of the patriarchal rules so and well when I ask them the what is the dreaming about the future mostly they need the more support and the about the just transition they need to like not only the economically also the socially supporting and econ uh, and also the health about the health issues they will they um, uh, they are expecting some support from government so uh, well with this actually I'm almost finished well uh, the last things about the, the, the in, about the interviews to like uh, this hope like is also related with their gender rules and they try to change this and with this like the more connecting with uh, uh, the about the powerful environmental but also more equality this like moments uh, they will expect this so for now is uh, thank you and I finish it we continue the next part uh, Thank you, Oskia. Um, Nata can take over. Uh, hi, my name is Nata, and uh, uh, I was born in Chebuksari, Czech Republic, uh, which is located in Russia, and currently I live in Moscow. I did my research in Tipshirma, which is a village uh, in uh, Czech Republic where my father grew up, grew up and uh, I have uh, uh, three points, uh, environmental, economic, and ethnic, that uh, uh, was extremely uh, important for my research. So you can see uh, how village uh, uh, looks. And uh, uh, in terms of environment, uh, for most villagers, uh, being environmentally uh, friendly and being environmentally conscious is about not littering and about uh, clean up events that they create uh, in the village, especially uh, young people who live in the village. Uh, also, they, uh, some of them, they noticed how climate change uh, influences their uh, life, uh, especially crops. Uh, however, they do not consider it as a threat. And they mostly hope that it's just like a few years and it will get better. Uh, also, in terms of economic uh, economics, uh, uh, this region is located in uh, Volga, Federal District of Russia, and it's a uh, bottom 25 uh, regions by average wage. So uh, crops are really important to people, uh, and uh, majority of uh, the villagers uh, they spend uh, most of their uh, paychecks for food. So it's not a very wealthy region. Uh, and ethnically, you can uh, go to the next pictures. It's not. Uh, uh, it's an uh, ethnical minority lives mostly in the village and in the Republic, it's Chuvash people. You can see the embroidery and costumes. Uh, and uh, there is also a problem with the um, assimilation that's happening because many people living in the region and in, uh, in the village, especially the young ones, they do not know how to speak uh, Chuvash language. And uh, maybe they speak it uh, with a mixed uh, Russian and Chuvash a language and uh, also there is another uh, point about uh, uh, being discriminated also based on the ethnicity because non-slavic people uh, in Russia they face uh, also such uh, stereotypes as being not cultured enough uh, or maybe being like uh, stupid or lazy like typical uh, 
uh, stereotypes. So those women that I interviewed, they uh, also had this. And uh, for me, it was um, amazing how they cared about the culture, but they felt that they are uh, more assimilated than their parents and that their children is uh, being even more uh, assimilated into uh, you know, Russian culture. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's why I, I really liked interviewing them and uh, finding these things. Thank you. Thank you, Nata. Uh, now, Paulina can take over. Yeah, thank you. I prepared some text for me to read and I hope it will be all right if I will just read it out, uh, out loud. So hello everyone, my name is Paulina Burko. I'm an activist of the Belarusian and Greens and currently I work in Ecofom. It's uh, the oldest Belarusian environmental NGO. So me being Belarusian and writing an article about Baltic Sea in Latvia, it happened because I'm a refugee and I had to leave my country because of the persecution and that's how I basically get, got there and that's where I did my research. Um, in that article, I even wrote at the very beginning that it all started with my, I would say, love to the Baltic Sea. I started, the like, first time I saw it was in when I was 13 years old, and I started to dream living near it. And surprisingly, it turned out that I really started to live there, and I decided to ask people around what they feel about living there, living close to the seaside. Um, in the announcement for this meeting, it was written that my article tells the stories of young women from two different groups. Uh, those who have knowledge about the ecological uh, state of the environment and those who have some kind of idealistic image of uh, living by the sea. But in the real life, it was quite different. Uh, it turned out that uh, it was difficult to divide women into two groups uh, because there is basically a very thin line between, uh, between knowledge of en environmental problems and not knowledge. And also I felt that sometimes when I, for example, try to find more women to talk about environment, they were all saying like, oh, we don't know anything. And in the real life, it happened differently. Like they knew many things. And I just assumed that it's because uh, women usually tend to Devalue their experiences and their knowledge, unfortunately. Uh, the article is rather the stories of ordinary young women who love the sea and live by it, living by it very much. And also uh, stories of those who see the problems of what is happening there. Uh, it also happened unexpectedly for me that um, girls from different social groups took part in the interview. And it showed the problems from the different sides. For example, some of the participants were from more like privileged groups. And uh, surprise, or surprisingly or not surprisingly, they didn't see much problems. Uh, but when I asked people from not really privileged uh, families or not from rich, uh, not with a rich background, it's, uh, it was quite opposite. Um, also, originally, I wanted to focus more on fishing, nuclear pollution, uh, because there is such a thing after World War II. Uh, I did some research before making an article, and I found out that uh, after the Second World War, there are some bombs left in the sea. And because of those bombs, uh, some nuclear pollution comes to the seashore and people get injured. Also, I wanted to write about pollution caused by the Soviet army during the collapse of the USSR. But I guess because the participants were young women and also I uh, interviewed them on a bit different uh, part of the Baltic Sea uh, on the Windows Gulf. Uh, but mostly those things happened on the open uh, part of the Baltic Sea, uh, which is a bit from, from the west of Latvia. Uh, and it happened that uh, the research was mostly focused on uh, issues that are happening because of the tourism and what it brings to the environment and as well as many social factors of living in Latvia for young women in general, for example, it's safety, it's economical condition, etc. And also some cultural things that are happening uh, 
Yeah. I asked the girls about the environmental and social problem problems they face as well as their daily lives. Also, I try to focus on uh, just their everyday life. Like I try to ask what they do and if it's enough for them uh, to spend, like enough places for them to spend their free time. And uh, it was really important for me to understand whether uh, they are comfortable living by the sea, whether it's safe. Uh, and also in the end of each interview, I ask about uh, what you would like to change in the future and what to leave as it is. Uh, also, one of the questions was uh, if it's easy to actually bring changes uh, to their uh, lives near the Baltic Sea in Latvia. Uh, for me, their answers to these questions were quite surprising. Uh, and later during our discussion, I will answer why. And yeah, I chose this topic because of my love for the sea. And it was really nice to meet women who are similar to me in this. Uh, of course, I faced some difficulties with finding these people because uh, like my friends who helped me to uh, find uh, women for the interviews, they said that Latvians are mostly introversial and it really happened like that. I even had to face it, that it, it was hard to ask people to actually participate in something like that. Mostly people like were closed, but somehow it turned out well in the end. And also uh, for me, it was quite difficult, difficult because I'm not Latvian and they also saw like cultural differences which were like exchanged with me. And it was like interesting to observe. Uh, yeah, and I hope that um, the article will be interesting to read, uh, not just interesting, I hope that it will bring some changes to the Baltic Sea region in Latvia. That's it. Thank you, Paul, so much. Uh, we have two more presentations. Um, one of them is from Carla from uh, Croatia. Uh, unfortunately, she will not be able to present tonight, but we will just cover it briefly. So Carla is from uh, Croatia from the village Konstina, but lives in Zagreb. And uh, the local research that she did was in her hometown. Um, yeah, also now she um, is a member of, of, um, uh, um, of um, um, Croatian member organization of CD and Zeleni Proza. Uh, so the, the research was done in Konstina. This is the, it, the focus of the research was on waste incineration and waste, actually waste management strategy uh, in Croatia. Uh, the major issue in Konstina that struggled the uh, kind of the movement of fighting against uh, relocation of uh, European waste to, to the borders, like to the periphery of the uh, European Union. Uh, it kind of sparked other uh, locations, other villages in Croatia also to move on with the story. So, the, the story of Konstina, it was actually the first city where the it was kind of pushed for uh, the waste incineration plant to be built. And this is where it was actually supposed to be built. So it's quite a pretty area and it has a, uh, it is famous for its vineyards. Uh, however, the people who fought this story were the uh, were local activists who, uh, so one of them was a very active um, in general in an environmental movement. Um, and uh, in, together with the local uh, female politicians, they are managing to make some changes and to spark this um, um, this kind of rebellion against waste, waste incineration. So I'm not going to go super into depth about Carla's article. You can read it um, in the um, in the publication. But yeah, it's very interesting because this uh, issue is so not only about waste incineration and kind of corruption, but also about um like health hazards to people that would be happening because of this so this is uh so this place where where it was supposed to be built it, it is just down the road from the kindergarten and it is very in very close proximity to where people live so <laughs> that's a very sped up speedy uh, presentation about the uh, local research in croatia and now I will move to my own research in uh, Czech Republic. Uh, it is uh, focusing around Uhelna. Uh, Uhelna is a village in the north uh, northwest part, at the, like at the very border with the Polish border. And like, uh, so there is a so, okay. <laughs> the story focuses on uh, the black triangle, so called. Um, in this picture, geographically, you can't really see that it's a triangle, but it is assumed. So it is a border region. 
between Germany, Poland, and Czech Republic. And um, in general, it uh, takes um, most of the, the surface is actually on the German part, but um, most of the pollution and harm is on the Czech Republic. And what is actually happening is that on Polish side, so around here, um, there is a power plant and a, a coal mine. So this area is generally, it is rich in lignite and uh, this uh, power plant is digging out um, a lot of um, around 3.7 million, supplying 3.7 million people with electricity in Poland. Uh, but the problem is that uh, during the years it's been very polluted uh, because of this intensive coal mining and coal burning and it is having effects. Uh, so environmental effects are mostly on the German and uh, Polish, uh, German and Czech side, uh, while on the Czech side, um, the their like uh, forests are being, uh, they, well, they used to be um, annihilated by the acid rain that was caused by pollution, while in, uh, in the German side, the levels are, like, the ground levels are sinking. So this is just that you can see approximately on the presentation where the most uh, the most pollution is. So it is not that much in Poland. It's very much on the periphery. So it is affecting Poland, but uh, the major effects um, of uh, air pollution are in Czech Republic. Uh, this is a bit blurry image, but 50% uh, of the forests in the area were, as I said, uh, annihilated by acid rains, and only today they are being fixed. Uh, there have been some, uh, so in the 80s, uh, actually in the 90s, uh, the three countries, they came to agreement to um, enhance technologies and um, um, kind of enhance the environmental strategy. So the power plant itself turned to more uh, technology, uh, more environmentally friendly technologies, but uh, the pollution is still present, but uh, these protests that you can see on the picture from the <laughs> stock image, they're actually not because of the pollution. So the major issue currently in the border area uh, happening in Czech Republic is that uh, water is being cut off to, um, to residents in Ohelna and, um, and uh, around the, uh, well, pretty much all villages near the border. And why is this happening is because the thermal power plant and the coal mine, they, they are still working and the mine is expanding to the very periphery of, to, to the very border. So a woman that I've done, I've done interview with that lives uh, on this border says that she's literally in the back, in the backyard of, um, um, of, of Turo and that she can see it from her backyard. So the problem is not only um, that the water is being cut off, but also noise pollution and the dust pollution. It is affecting many people, as I said, uh, but uh, this has actually turned into, um, it started as a, as a local issue in uh, the villages that are being cut off water, but it turned into a first legal case of one, uh, one country, one European country, uh, European Union country suing another one. Uh, in this case, it was a uh, Czech Republic suing Poland. But the very interesting characteristic of this research is that the locals, they were united and the local government supported them. But uh, after the, after they joined power, kind of local government with the state government, and they took the, took the case to European court, uh, the the state government kind of took over and all the negotiations that were being done to prevent the expansion and to prevent the uh, the work of thermal power plant because it was actually mining illegally. Um, they were kind of stopped because of profits. And uh, at some point, Czech withdrew from the um, negotiation because they got what they wanted and uh, that was money. Uh, one of the things that was in the agreements is that uh, they built some pipes that basically the Pol Polish side gives uh, the Czech side some pipes and uh, money for to build underground barriers and pipes and dust uh, dust blockers. Uh, but uh, this year is actually, you can see from the local research from Helna uh, is that these are water level monitoring station, uh, but the water is continu continually dropping. Like it's currently, it is at the point where it was supposed to be um, uh, at 2024, 20, 2044, when the power plant and coal mine were supposed to stop working because of depletion of uh, sources, but uh, they 
continued expansion and the water levels are dropping more rapidly. It's even worse when there's drought. Um, one of the things from the agreement is these water level monitoring stations, which are actually not in control of the Czech side, but of the Polish side. So they can't really know what is happening. Uh, one of the organizations that is working mostly on this, uh, that is actually helping the locals when the government abandoned them, uh, is Frank Bold Associations, and they posted uh, these uh, demands for the for the Turo, Turo mine to stop to protect Czech communities. I'm not going to read them out, uh, but you can find it on Frank Bold's, uh, Bold's page. Um, actually, one of the research, one of the interviews is with the lawyer from from this organization. Uh, recent developments have been that uh, the Toro was ordered to stop mining and stop the expansion because it was uh, violating um, um, environmental agreements and breaking a bunch of laws, uh, which you will read about in the, in the, in the publication. But uh, recent develop developments are that the European Commission ordered, actually European Court ordered um, a 50 million euro fine per day uh, to do Turo because it did not stop mining. And uh, currently they are oh, another blurry image. Uh, currently the are actually the uh, uh, coal miners, which are living off this uh, power plant. It is some sources say that it's uh, up to 5,000 people employed. So not to go super lengthy into it. Um, this is uh, Zuzana from the, from the local research and in the background you can see uh, some wind turbines that are also part of the actually they were supposed to be part of the agreement but the uh, point is that because of Turov power plant uh, Poland cannot access um, um, just transition um, funds to um, switch to more renewable energies and yeah it's a very complicated legal case and you will um, you can learn more about it, but yeah, for now, that would be all for presentations. Um, I hope you are still <laughs> tuned in and listening. Let me just see if there are any questions in the chat, which we will go back to. Uh, but yeah, uh, after he hearing all the stories, uh, we could have seen that um, like this uh, points of gender and environment and climate are very interconnected. In some stories, maybe not be obvious, but uh, right now in these presentations, but uh, it, it is definitely elaborated in um, in the in the articles, which will be in the publication. Uh, but yeah, maybe now we can reflect a little bit on uh, the point of this project. So these three pillars of the project, youth, gender and environment, what does this actually mean? And what is the um, kind of what role did gender um, play in the local society where uh, people did the research? Uh, I will give floor to uh, local reporters, and then after that, uh, if you have some points, we can continue the discussion. But yeah, maybe uh, it was interesting to see um, the, the gender aspect in um, in all the stories. But yeah, let's maybe first see um, Paulina's part. You explained it a bit, but uh, yeah, how is this uh, this gender aspect? How how is this situation that is happening in this state influencing uh, different genders? What does it mean in the local community? Uh, everyone who I asked were talking about safety issues that uh, women face some difficulties uh, just walking in small places they live. And especially it's really connected with the culture, as already mentioned. Uh, I feel like, and that's what we discussed with uh, those women, that it's actually affected with the culture of um, I don't know how to say it correctly and not discriminating other people, but uh, I think like pro Russian who are pro Kremlin people, and in Latvia, unfortunately, there are a lot of people like that. And unfortunately, they have uh, a tradition to drink alcohol a lot. And that's basically what everyone said on the research that uh, because of this, because mostly all the people who are like, more educated. Uh, they tend to go to big cities and other who are you know, not uh, educated or who are just like, don't want to do something like that. They just stay there and uh, they start drinking alcohol or even uh, consuming some uh, psychoactive substances, which are like, uh, I mean, dangerous ones. And uh, yeah, that, that affects uh, their safety a lot. 
Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, the safety aspect is very important, and in Osga's research, um, it's it's quite strong. So maybe also you can reflect a little bit more. Yes, uh, actually, well, I can some example from the this point uh, because of the, the call as the like to the sun sickness is getting increased, like the cancer or like respiratory trait diseases like and the most of people getting sick sick every day and the the, the woman that i talk and i observe also is usually said like uh they are more responsible like home care service like they have to care take they have to take care like their parents or husband's parents or the also the kids like their children so it's like more responsible uh the, about this than the man and if like uh, the getting like uh dependent the house and they are they are losing their like uh social uh you know like social freedom like they don't go they cannot go outside freely because they have to care the, like to the moms or otherwise like something like that and the other things actually is like kind of paradox but the mostly woman is like based in rural and most of them like the kind of farmer but small farmers they have uh they have their own like gardens small gardens and they with this woman like to can uh, some gain the, some money and they have some like freedom they had actually but with this like pollution the water soil and the air is like poison and the whole the like to uh, the soil and all vegetables and other things like uh, it's not actually not working at, at all so the woman lost their jobs actually their economically freedom and they are getting more uh, connected with, with their like uh, husbands mostly so mostly husbands like or the men's actually work at to work at the uh, uh, power plant so and they more all the old family start to scare off to lose their job and they don't say anything about uh, this like poison things because the the only one person responsible about the economical uh freedom and this like kind of paradox and unfortunately and the woman is more responsible and the more needy the whole process Yeah, thank you. This is a very interesting to mention also the this gender division of labor kind of, um, and that can bring us to the point of this patriarchal society that is uh, giving all the um, all the kind of unpaid labor to women in general and in these these communities where it's these these divisions are very strict. It is uh, very noticeable. Uh, I think in uh, Ana Maria's uh, example, it was also um like a very villagey i think you mentioned at some point that uh, they they come back to home and they still have a lot of things to do so maybe you can uh, Ana Maria, reflect a little bit on that and also like how do they cope with these so they work uh and they prepare the uh, they work in agriculture and they sell their products and you both mentioned the economical freedom so uh women uh, women in Ana Maria's case they this is their only source of um economic um input uh so yeah maybe you can reflect uh, how different this so this is their way of surviving and their way of doing activism so uh, they have some way to deal with these environmental issues so yeah you said it all right um the the society of the Podrinia region is very patriarchal and it has actually always kind of been it's not something that uh, happened only after the war, uh, as it usually is in Bosnia. Uh, in that region, uh, it was always kind of a poor region. And uh, in order to 
uh, survive, people worked in agriculture, and in order in order to uh, work, they uh, had many kids who actually were only there to help them, their parents, and uh, therefore many parents decided not to send girls to the school and not allow them to go to school. And uh, some of these women that we work now actually have uh, finished only elementary schools. And um, that already meant that it is going to be super hard for them to find any uh, regular job. So yeah, they, it was uh, kind of okay for them to work in agriculture, but they also did not uh, used to not earn anything from there. And only when we started to help them to organize fear, fears for them, uh, then we uh, saw them uh, earning some money for themselves. And that's, that, that change is really visible because they say that they uh, now uh, also have, have uh, a role when there's a decision-making process because now they are money. And uh, now they uh, drive cars and uh, that is uh, very important for them because they live in villages um, that are very far from the cities, for example, 20 kilometers or more, and there is no other uh, mean of communication or transport. And uh, yeah, they work a lot. They work in fields and when they get home, they make lunch, they clean the house, they help kids with the school, they do basically everything. And um, they don't see that much of an issue in those things uh, because it is natural to them. But also, uh, we started with this uh, gender workshops with them, where their partners also participate. And um, once we discussed the the home, um, the roles in the in the home, who does what, and one of the women said, uh, for example, when me and my husband go to field, we both work. But as soon as we get home, he says, is there something to eat? And then I answer to him, you've been with me on the field. You have been there too. And no, there's nothing to eat. And uh, now they can't say those things. But like 10, day, 10 years ago, they would only like be quiet and go make something for food. And that's, that's the change that we see. Definitely visible in Parliament. I actually have an interesting thing to, to kind of relate how different it is kind of uh, in this very Eastern Europe, in a, in a village in Eastern Europe and in a village in Central Europe, uh, because I noticed, um, actually, I talked with the local research, uh, with the uh, with Susanna from the research, um, she mentioned how the, there are 12 people in the village and uh, most of those families are actually very uh, progressive. There is not such a traditional division of labor. So uh, even though like actually uh, in the research, she was the only one that did, she, she was the only woman from the village that uh, um, that showed up in the media at all. Uh, but at the same time, she also had a job and took care of the kids, but there was a lot more support in the sense of uh, her family supporting her and not having this additional labor. So it's, uh, it's quite a lot of differences kind of geographically seen, but um, on a more smaller geographical level, um, there are also differences how we do activism in urban and how we do in rural areas. So um, in uh, rural areas, it's more about survival. So these environmental issues that are uh, at hand, so health issues, water being cut off, uh, pollution, um, it is um, like these people actually have to do the um, they have to do activism in their own way, and um, it is probably more difficult than it is. Um, maybe, Elena, you can reflect how different it is to do activism in rural and uh, urban areas. Uh, yes, thanks. I was just in the middle to, uh, of uh, answering the scene, so maybe I can answer that too, if that's fine. Um, it is... Uh, not so much connected actually um uh question you posed i guess uh evidently it is much easier to do any sort of activism in urban areas in capital as such we have such advantage uh that uh, we might not be aware of uh before looking into these rural areas and um yes um i think uh other movements we had from rural areas were gaining 
uh, a lot of uh, power, so, so to speak, uh, not a good word, but uh, they were gaining a lot of strength uh, in uh, their organizing when there were activists from other areas joining and uh, when they were pushing their visibility. Um, so um, there is that really um, big uh, interest into um, helping these local communities in rural areas so their voices can be heard uh, farther. Otherwise, if, it's, if it just remains in, on like um, in this local municipality, uh, it's very, the visibility is not very good and it's uh, under question what these people can actually do. And this is something that I would also like to push more uh, after the research takes place, because I was talking with some journalists also that didn't know what was quite going on uh, in that area. And I think that um, since this uh, uh, fight of these locals is still ongoing, it's uh, good to support their voices and um, yeah, reach out to different kinds of uh, organizations uh, that can help. Um, so yeah, that, that I would say a huge disadvantage right from the start. Um, uh tell me if i can answer now the the other question or should i write it continue writing it down it's fine if you answer okay <laughs> thanks um so um i started writing saying that i still have yet i still have to do other conversations and discussions before i can answer fully to this uh to this question however one thing that i did notice uh is that especially uh, from this young uh, person, um, she had very, um, she had a lot of mention and reflection on the future generations, future developments, that they are not to be done in a way that uh, are, um, yeah, um, damaging others, no? Uh, she, was, she had this huge, strong mention of the future, uh, reflection on the future, while, reading other articles and hearing what other people were saying, um, well, uh, men, uh, it was very, it was speaking about the same issue, but a bit very, a bit of a different uh, kind of uh, stance. Uh, it was, you know, our, our land and very much in the, in the now moment, if that makes sense. So this is one thing that I did notice that this girl did speak also and reflect on a broader context of this kind of changing uh, environments, uh, which I found was very, very important message to portray. Thanks. Thanks, Elena. Cien, do you have some, yeah, I hope it was answered to you. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, yeah, uh, this different coverage also kind of brings us to the point of uh, how, so these uh, articles, actually what, what I noticed kind of in all articles uh, that were revolving around some specific situation was this uh, media attention and uh, the visibility that people have. So in the beginning, it was like this very noticeable. In the beginning, as Elena said, they don't really have support and they're at a disadvantage, but at some point, um, it kind of gathers up, they gather some momentum and they gain the attention and they get, gain support. So I would reflect on my local research from Czechia uh, that, um, so in the beginning uh, when the when the movement was just small, well, actually there was no movement. The people uh, who were living in the villages, they were feeling the effects of water being cut off and all the, all the negative emotions around Turov. Um, to a coal mine and uh, they started kind of gathering in their villages and uh, they started some movements together so these 12 people in the <laughs> the 12 people in some surrounding villages they reached out to environmental organization check anglings and so on and uh, they managed to gather around some um uh, gather some movement that would spark some media attention and it did and um at that point, while it was still small, the local government was supporting them. So it was totally with them. It was visiting the village and it was noting down everything that was happening. And it even uh, led it to, uh, to, to the attention of the state government. But at that point, something changed and uh, it was turned to some drive towards profit. And this was kind of noticeable in uh, all local, local, well, most local researches that uh, when government takes over, uh, it is mostly focused around profit. 
but yeah i was actually wondering how it's like um um in uh, in some situations like um, osgas because it's a problem of um some private investors also um how was the government's reaction to this uh, massive industrial yes and well i can um again like uh, give this some example about that usually well mostly the many projects actually uh is a similar thing but like uh if you talk about to like coal, coal power plants uh usually governments like energy policy based on the coal so they are really really supportive about uh, this like uh this whole many process or the, if the company has a problem, they just to fix it is the basically. So there are some laws, like we have also like uh, the whole company has to do like environmental impact assessment and they have to prove this. But usually even though like they really kind of fake assessments, but still like uh, just, uh, okay, just let go, let's go and continue with that. Uh, it's really easy to like uh, pass the law for the companies. Uh, they have many rights, unfortunately. And uh, otherwise, like to activists or, or like NGOs or the people, local people who resist. Uh, well, many like to see it like cases, law. And uh, usually they have to be really, really passionate about this because the whole things like spending many years uh it's not easy for them uh maybe the last one example about the chan is uh the power plant is actually really old a second power plant it's actually like old power plant can come from the austria it's not the like new one is the second hand kind of plant so they are really uh unhealthy and they really don't uh, care about to healthy conditions like there is no filter not the new one actually so the actually they have to change it they like there is a law about that uh, but the government has just to pass away like they okay like this you have the deadline about that but you can like we can post postpone this it's okay so we like to many organizations did campaign about this and after that they just uh the step back away but it's really hard and the people usually just uh, need to actually not government just has to follow the rules actually not at all we not we <laughs> do not need their sports actually just they the follow the rules and it's okay because the is like the all healthy environmental conditions is like uh it's right at the law national law so but they don't care about that it's basically first of all we need this yeah thank you i think this is a problem generally in eastern europe i think um especially in uh, in belgrade what's happening uh, but yeah that is some different topic um yeah uh thank you everyone for presenting uh i think in general um we could discuss about this for years <laughs> approximately um but yeah we're not gonna go super deep into discussion uh some of the some of the things were left unsaid uh but um uh they they will be explained in the publication um i see actually um uh, from masha question uh party or which party is majority in this region. Uh, so it's kind of divided between the regions. So the, the smallest local region is uh, some very leftist party, but then uh, on the Krai, the, the bigger region, it's uh, it's center right. And then uh, when, it, when it was moved to, um, to state, uh, it was kind of center, but that was the prime minister that was doing negotiation. He was removed now from position. So, um, it's a lot of things happen recently with the elections. Um, sorry that I interrupted the flow, but yeah, um, if anyone has any questions um, or something that you would like to bring up, feel free to take uh, to write your name in the chat. Um, thank you for being here. And um, yeah, again, if you have any questions, you can send an email. Uh, you can find the information on CDN's uh, website. Um, but yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> to not take too much time, uh, I hope this got, got you interested into the, into the publication and that when it's shared, uh, you will read it and that you would pay attention actually to what is happening in your local environments, but the more rural, rural areas and all the different contexts that, uh, uh, that, are, that need to be considered for, for the rural areas and in the context of gender and, uh, um, and the kind of location. <laughs> Uh, hopefully it gets you to thinking and uh, thank you once again for coming. Uh, do actually local reporters have some final words, something, um, some empowering moments that you would like to share with the others? <laughs> Ana Maria? Maybe just one thing to remember that you should never let uh, the bad government or big corporations to stop passing your ideas and to let them win the easy way. Yeah, thank you, Anna Maria. Um, Elena, was that a hand? I'm sorry, I didn't catch. Not sure. <laughs> um i can i can say maybe a few words also i uh, you said empowering uh, moment no i think uh, having shared a bit about this uh, story uh, around highway i think it's quite impressive that truly a handful of people is still not giving up um, after almost two years and i think that uh, for what I shared also before, having it uh, way more difficult from the very start, uh, trying to fight uh, for something, um, we can take some, I guess, uh, strength from that and uh, move uh, forward our fights in our local realities. I think that's quite, uh, yeah, uh, empowering. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Very good uh, ending note. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, any other questions, comments on the on the local researches or project in general? Okay. If no, then we can slowly end the the presentation and discussion. Thank you for coming. Um, we can um, stop the live stream now, and um, yeah, hopefully we see each other. In, uh, in online sphere talking about this again. Thank you. Oscar, you had a hand raised? Oh yes, as just quickly one word, like, well, it's really good opportunity being together here is like another empowerment actually, just the moment and thank you for the like, and Jeff and the CDN is the last words. <laughs>